Hello, I'm Askar Sharif and you're watching the news from Kazakhstan and these are the headlines. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev has conducted an official visit to Kazakhstan. During the talks with the country's leadership, the sides mainly discussed long-term friendship between the two states, despite calls of Russian human rights activists to raise the Janozen issue. Kazakh Altan miners in the Akmola region went on day-long strike. The operation of the enterprise resumed when the leadership promised to meet the workers' demands to raise wages. Almaty hosted an award ceremony to honor Kazakhstan's journalists with a prestigious Altan Juldis Prize. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev and Patriarch of Russian Orthodox Church Kirill are conducting an official visit to Kazakhstan. Both arrived on different dates, but their key meetings were held on Tuesday. The Patriarch of Moscow and all the Rus arrived at the capital's airport Monday afternoon, from where he was taken to the Astana Cathedral to perform the rite of consecration of the newly built Kazakhstan's archdiocese. The Patriarch's main purpose of the visit is to take part in the Fifth Congress of World Religions. In his brief interview, Kirill praised Nazarbayev, noting his wise policy on strengthening interfaith and interreligious harmony. The meeting between the Russian Premier and Kazakhstan's leader was held in a similar positive mood. The long-time friendly and good neighbor relations between the two countries have become the determining factors for Medvedev's choice of Kazakhstan as the country for his first official visit in a new position. In response, Nazarbayev noted in his speech that these relations should serve as an example for the whole world. Russia and Kazakhstan show and the whole world how the relationships are built between the neighbors. Russia and Kazakhstan are showing to the CIS member states as well as the rest of the world how to build relations between neighbors. Over 20 years we have created absolutely equal and neighborly ties and alliances. I must say that during your presidency we have solved a lot of important historical questions. We have adopted united custom rates, set up the customs union, unified economic zone and taken other necessary decisions. At regional meetings we have addressed specific issues. Russian Prime Minister Medvedev held several meetings in Astana on Tuesday, including with his Kazakhstan's counterpart Karim Masimov, several ministers, as well as the heads of Kazatomprom and Kaz Energy Vladimir Shkolnik and Timur Kolibayev. The topics discussed, as state media reported, were related to some technical changes to the friendship agreement and issues of rocket launches from the Baikonur Space Center. The official media have not said if Medvedev discussed Janozen events with the president of Kazakhstan, as it was demanded before the meeting by the Russian activists. The neighboring country's human rights advocates wrote an open letter to the head of the Russian government. The letter called Medvedev to raise the issue of inadmissibility of persecuting trade unions and political opposition after the December events. Among others, the letter said signatories included the chair of the Moscow Helsinki group Lyudmila Alexeyeva, leader of the Russian movement for human rights Lev Panamaryov and co-chair of Labour Protection Trade Union Alex Shane. During your meeting with Kazakhstan's officials and especially President of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, we urge you to touch upon the fact that in the past, the interpretation of independent trade unions' actions as subversive and capable of inciting social hatred was used only by fascist and other reactionary dictatorships. We urge you to express your concern about disproportionate use of force and brutality during the suppression of protest actions and systematic violations of rights of suspects and defendants. Our Moscow colleagues came up with the idea for this letter and as a trade unionist I have fully supported it. I believe that every decent person must stand up for those who had been killed or thrown in jail in Kazakhstan. As for whether Medvedev will respond to it, as we all know, little strokes fell great oaks and sooner or later public opinion will have its effect. Dmitry Medvedev's visit to Kazakhstan as the Prime Minister of Russia is his second international tour. After the participation in the G8 summit in the US, Medvedev's decision to visit Kazakhstan was announced only a few days before the trip. Prior to this, there were active discussions in Russia and Kazakhstan media about the possibility of Vladimir Putin's traveling to Kazakhstan, making it his first international visit as the President. Putin, however, chose Belarus instead but promised to visit Kazakhstan on June 7th after Uzbekistan and China. In the opinion of influential Russian political scientists, scientist and orientalist Alexei Malashenko, such arrangement of priorities does not imply changes for the Russian-Kazakh relations.
While Nazarbayev and Putin are still alive, there will be no major changes in their relationship. They have established a wise consensus, understanding each other both formally and otherwise. With regard to Lukashenko, Putin's relationship with him is much more complicated. Lukashenko should always be kept on a short leash. Russia values Kazakhstan several times greater than Belarus. It is the only self-sustaining state in Eurasia. Russia is highly interested in it, but it also conducts a multi-vector policy. Это самостоятельное государство, это единственное, с моей точки, евразийское государство. While with a visit to Belarus, Russian President Vladimir Putin proposed to create the Eurasian Union Parliament. Putin expressed hope that his colleagues in Kazakhstan and Belarus will support the idea. Additional integration processes were also discussed Tuesday by representatives of oil companies Belarus Neft and Russian Zarubesh Neft are planning to join. Soyuz Neftia Dacia Consortium with a further invitation extended to Kazmonai Gas. The letters board chairman Timur Kulibayev has yet again appeared on the pages of European newspapers. The money received by the son-in-law of the Kazakhstan's president as a bribe from Italian oil giant Yeni was spent on the purchase of the Sunning Hill Park Manor from British Prince Andrew, reports The Telegraph. The publication noted that at the moment Italian and Swiss prosecutors are investigating the episode involving Timur Kulibayev's receiving a minimum of $20 million from Yeni. These assets were allegedly intended for the investment projects in Kashagan. Kulibayev bought Prince Andrew's manor for £15 million in 2007, although for several years the royal family was unsuccessful in its attempts to sell the property even for £12 million. According to the British press, Timur Kulibayev, along with his rumored mistress Goga Ashkenazi and several of their friends, have agreed about the details of the transaction while vacationing in Thailand. The accommodation and dinner in Phuket were covered by Arvind Tiku, a well-known partner of Kulibayev. Ashkenazi denied the corruption emphasis of the deal, just like the Buckingham Palace press service. But the Italian and Swiss prosecutors found some interested in the overpayment of £3 million and now intend to seek the disclosure of the transaction details. The trial of the ex-mayor of Janozeno Rak Sarbapiev is continuing in Aktau with a questioning of case witnesses. On Tuesday, the court listened to the testimonies of the former first deputy head of the Mangistau region, Amangili, Amangildi Aitkulov, and a member of Janozen administration, Daliva, formerly responsible for the quality of conducted tenders. Sarbapiev's attorneys asked the court and especially the jury to take into account the opinions of two officials as witnesses. However, their testimonies were vague. Both confirmed that they know Sarbapiev very well, but they didn't give him any orders. The rest of the information was not substantial. After the lunch break, the court viewed video evidence provided by the investigation agencies. The footage showed locations where Sarbapiev, while acting as the governor, may have taken $50,000 and instructed to build him a small grocery store in the new district of the city in exchange for patronage during the tender bidding. The defendant pleaded not guilty and believes that he performed his duties conscientiously. But the trial takes progress quite uneventfully, with the jury looking apathetic, not having asked a single question. The number of uh, the people involved in the trial is steadily decreasing as they gradually lose interest in the case. Those still attending the hearing regularly are wondering why Sarbapiev is charged with financial fraud and not with the tragic December violence, for which he is partly responsible as well. I take this trial as nothing but a show, the illusion of trying a mayor of Janozien. They talk about one and a half million dollars allegedly received by Sarbapiev. Whether he actually took it or not, it is not the issue. On the contrary, witness Sadikov discredited himself by testifying about it. I don't understand how does this trial relate to the events of December 16. I assume they want to trick us, those end residents, into believing that this is what was happening in Janozien. I think this is just another show. Theatre director Bulat Atabayev refuses to travel to Aktau on May 30th for questioning in court. The National Security Committee bought him only one-way ticket, which outraged the public activist. Atabayev demands a round-trip ticket for himself and his attorney in addition to the accommodation in town. To recap, the theatre director is charged with inciting social hatred, even though investigators cannot find elements of the crime in his actions, thus remaining with a suspect status. The public activist is afraid that once he arrives in Aktau, the authorities will replace his own recognizance with an actual arrest. 
Today I received an offer from Nazarbayev Security Committee to depart to Aktau from Almaty with Scott Airline. I refuse because I know that my lawyer cannot fly there and I cannot afford to pay for another one. The NSC has no intentions to pay my lawyer's travel costs and without him I will not go there. Plus, I was told by experts that once I arrive in Janozian and visit the NSC, I will be arrested. Public activists call the population of the country to take part in events organized by, to commemorate the victims of political repressions. On May 31st, a rally is planned to take place in the park next to the pre-trial detention facility of the National Security Committee Department in Almaty. As was clarified by Alihan Ramazanov, who defended the participants of Shanarak events, the selected location is very symbolic. The safest place is next to this government agency, which was involved in repressions during Soviet times and even nowadays. It's the successor organization of KGB in its worst form. Razia Nutushova, the sister of one of the Kazakhstan's political prisoners, Arona Tabek, participated in the press conference. She noted that her brother was forgotten six years after the tragic events on the outskirts of Almaty. At the legal trial of Shanurak, Atabek was given the most severe sentence of 18 years. During and after the trial, politicians and public figures were indeed interested in the poet's fate, but eventually they have forgotten about him. This, however, did not break Atabek, says his sister. While in prison, he continues to write books in hopes that justice will eventually prevail. I've contacted him by phone just recently. He asked me why weren't I doing anything and whether he's already of no use to anyone. All social organizations and political parties have forgotten about him, so I need to start dealing with it myself. But where do I start? We haven't even applied to the supervisory committee yet. Protest actions in support of the arrested opposition leader Vladimir Kozlov are still taking place around the country. On Tuesday, civil activists gathered in front of Pavlodar's national security headquarters demanded a transparent investigation in the case launched against the leader of Alga party pending registration. Public activists say that protests are only a coercive measure since the authorities do not want to disclose information about the physical condition of the arrested men. They are inclined to organize new pickets. Activists also believe Vladimir Kozlov is subjected to tortures. Therefore, they demand the authorities to allow the lawyers and oppositionists to visit the politician. We've learned from his wife that he's tortured for a confession. His wife found out about this from the inmates of the temporary detention facility where he was held. Friends and family visited these inmates and received information was spread eventually. The best journalists of Kazakhstan were awarded with Altin Juldis Prize in Almaty on Tuesday during an uncharacteristically modest ceremony. Mass media representatives discussed the difficulties at work but avoided mentioning the issue of why the most topical problems of the country are never covered by the mainstream press. More people have joined the Academy of Journalism on Tuesday. Honorary titles and certificates were awarded to Sergei Panamaryov, Samat Ibrahim and Amantai Dandagulov. The latter is the head of the publication Novaya Gazeta Kazakhstan, which gained fame during the dissenters protest in Russia. However, not everyone agrees that Dandagulov plays an important role back home. The only positive thing that Dan Tegulov does is publishing Kosanov's works. He has created a specific niche for him, as well as Moscow authors. However, this is just a drop in the bucket. We can safely assume that Kozabayev did not award Dan Tegulov for these publications. The celebration of government journalism, as some call it, went on with awarding the highest public national award, Altin Zhuldiz. Sakhambay Kozabayev spoke highly of the nominees. It should be noted that this is the first time that the ceremony was held in such a modest way, with no banquets and guest stars. However, this is not what the president at the Academy of Journalism is concerned about. He is more worried that journalists and reporters do not have a professional holiday to celebrate. Kozabayev wrote a letter to the president proposing to make May 10th the day of journalism, but he did not say a word regarding the events in Janaozian. <laughs> We don't have a custom of erecting monuments, although we should. When one has a headache, it goes to a doctor. When one has a heartache, it goes to a journalist. 90% of the reporters who are present here did not cover the events in Janaozian. Why is that? I can't answer questions like that. 
The academy member does not like answering uncomfortable questions. In the meantime, one can learn about the events in Zhanaozian and the west of the country from the internet or rare independent media sources. Very few reporters make it to the trial hearings in the Mangistar region. Evidently, it is not a good idea to mention that the 20th anniversary of Kazakhstan's independence was marked with opening fire at civilians and then torturing defendants for testimonies. The information sources are controlled by the government. As a result, mass media split into two camps. Sakhambay Kazabayev complains about the lack of funds to hold luxury awarding ceremonies, while Roslan Taukina is tired of living under constant surveillance. What happened in Zhanaozian is really tragic. Not only people were killed, but some were charged as well. This must become a tragedy for the entire country. And it comes as quite a shock to me to see people singing and dancing on TV today. Amirjan Khosanov made it to the award ceremony, although he has more than once suffered from information blockades. Having left journalism for politics, during the last election race he kept saying that his party was cut off the allocated airtime. However, the opposition leader sympathizes with the majority of the reporters. People work for the current government, either of their own will or against it, and the government keeps imposing strict censorship, making it impossible to tell the truth about events, especially when it concerns politics. But at the same time, despite counteraction, poor laws, and a practice of journalists' persecution, a whole class of independent journalism emerged during the years of the state independence. Observers say that intellectuals prefer to share their views on the internet. It is there the most resonant articles, public statements, and appeals are posted. There, bloggers, civic activists, and independent journalists take on the role of the impartial and objective informants. They, however, are not going to be awarded for this effort in the near future. Over a hundred workers of Kazakhstan went on strike on Tuesday, asking to increase their wages. The protests, however, were short-lived as already by evening the employer promised to fulfill the demands of the strikers and they returned to their workplaces. The Enterprises Press Service reported that a special commission will start its work at the deposit area on Wednesday to resolve the conflict. Company managers, the public prosecutor, officials, as well as the chairman of the union and workers intend to enter the negotiations. The employees are demanding to raise wages starting spring this year. At the meetings with the company's managers and the administration of Stepnagorsk, they were protesting against low wages and also complained about Kazakh Gold hiring workers from Kentau for higher per shift rates. People are now demanding lower production rates, improved working conditions, and an increase of mentorship bonuses. A leak of radioactive solution occurred at the uranium mining company Katko in the Sozak district of the South Kazakhstan region. The incident occurred full six months ago, but the public found out about it only now. The administration of the Kazakh French company concealed the information and failed to report about the emergency to the appropriate state bodies, which is a gross violation of the radioactive safety legislation. The truth about the leak was finally uncovered by the Special Environment Prosecution of the region. Ten administrative cases have been instigated against officials and Katko so far. During excavation works on November 25th last year, a major 5-meter in diameter fiberglass pipeline carrying product solution was damaged, causing a leak and the spill of 240 cubic meters of radioactive waste, covering an area of more than 2,000 square meters. During the inspection performed by the Special Environment Prosecutor's Office, it was confirmed that joint venture Katko did not entirely clean up the area affected by the radioactive waste spill. We took readings during the inspection. Specialists say that it had been raining and snowing a lot since November. Perhaps this caused the uranium to settle deeper into the soil. Perhaps for this reason, specialists say that as of now there is no increase in radiation background. However, the soil is contaminated by metals such as sulfate and there is an increase in calcium by 10 times in dissolved solids. It all shows that the soil contamination did occur. By now, the areas affected by the hazardous spill have been all cleared. More than 17 tons of low radioactive waste have been collected and placed in special temporary storage containers to be later buried and disposed of. Specialists from the Sanitary and Epidemiological Service say that readings taken at the affected area show the radiation not exceeding the maximum allowed concentration. 
The soil contaminated with this solution would be classified as radioactive waste, but as a matter of fact, the situation is not that bad. However, this is a radioactive contamination area and it needs to be cleaned. The soil is still fertile and many things can be grown here. However, we should not be deceived by that because everything that grows from this soil will be radioactive. The Almonte Prenatal Center was closed recently due to a scandal. The authorities are currently investigating the increased rate of child mortality reported by the facility. Specialists and state officials place the blame on the mothers. Next report has more. The recent death of three infants has led to an unscheduled inspection of the Almaty Perinatal Center. The prosecutors decided to find out why the number of similar tragedies has increased since the beginning of the year. So far, the preliminary findings are discouraging. Currently, 57 cases of child deaths are registered. 30 of them were infants. Following the inspection, the most strangest measures will be taken against officials who serve in the center, linked to or responsible for these deaths in any way. After the prosecutor's inspection, the center was closed. But according to doctors, not because of the elevated child mortality, but due to a regular sanitary cleaning of the center. The health ministry is aware of the death situation, but admit to only 34 cases. Officials and doctors say that mothers themselves are largely to blame. Some women come to the center already seriously ill, carrying numerous diseases, including sexually transmitted ones. With regard to infant and child mortality, I would like to say that the figure should be clarified. In fact, in a number of unfortunate cases, we had pregnant women come here with dead feti, and only abortions were performed here. There were also five episodes with the lethal outcome after surgical operations. In the meantime, doctors are still delivering newborns in the hospital, despite the lockdown of the facility. Recently, one of the patients posted on a social network about the details of her delivery. The woman refused to speak on camera, but she did confirm her complaints over the phone. Queen Sabina, as she is known on the internet, said that conditions in the medical center and qualifications of its staff leave much to be desired. The intensive care ward is a horrifying place. First of all, they didn't put a diaper on me for some reason, and I woke up in blood up to my knees. Even worse, they told me they do not have replacement sheets, and I had to lie in this pool of blood from noon to 10 in the evening. I couldn't find a nurse either. I wanted to drink so much, but there was no one who could pass me the bottle of water. I just lied there and stared at it. Another Almaty resident had a different experience. Elena Tsoi gave birth to her son here. During the first days, the doctors discovered that he had health problems and helped immediately. The hospital made great impressions. They were not rude to me and offered great service. In fact, we did not even wash the dishes. They fed us well and the staff, doctors and department heads were courteous. In my case, I am just delighted with the hospital. Whether there is any reason to doubt the professionalism and work of the center, it will become clear in a month, after the end of the current lockdown, which could be extended by prosecutors if necessary. Doctors will not accept any new patients during this time. In the case, if they are proven guilty, some employees will be punished. But the scandal has already tarnished the reputation of the new perinatal center that was opened just last November. During this time, about 120 healthy babies were born here. On the eve of the International Children's Day, psychologists and public activists held a press conference at Almaty talking about the problems of Kazakhstan's children. It is believed that rights of local children are poorly protected and are frequently violated. For instance, entrepreneur Kanagat Takeva voiced statistics for Almaty city and the region, where the banks seize apartments from, uh, from families with children due to their debts. We have quite accurate statistics and collected from local organizations and there are about 35 such families in the city. Unfortunately, even when we managed to get a reconsideration, there are still cases where court rulings were predetermined and families were evicted, but we still write appeals to the Supreme Court, etc. It's a very long process to return the illegally seized housing. The list of problems also includes teenage suicides, domestic pedophilia and difficulties in single-parent households. Civic activists refer 
started a neighboring Russia as an example and proposed to create an institute of children's ombudsman in Kazakhstan. Only then children's rights will be actually protected in the country. Mariana Gurina, like other parents of kids allegedly infected with hepatitis C in state medical institutions, has to appeal all the way to the United Nations to be heard. Gurina and the others do not believe in fairness of Kazakhstan's justice system or support from the government. According to the activists, children are left to face their diseases on their own. I have already written a report with an appeal for help because we need to stop the infection of children. These are our kids and they should not die. If only the country leadership could hear us. If only this issue that has been dragging on for almost three years had been resolved, we would not have to appeal to the international community. Two days before the start of the unified national testing for high school graduates, the Education and Science Ministry of Kazakhstan reported it about its prepared preparation progress. This year, officials took unprecedented security measures, installing metal detectors as well as cell phone jammers and surveillance cameras at most test locations. On Tuesday, May 29th, the Ministry of Education released the final report prior to the beginning of the Unified National Test, announcing the final figures and dates. The testing will be held from June 1st to June 15th, two weeks as opposed to 10 days last year. The submission period for appeals was also extended. In 2012, high school graduates may appeal against their scores until 2 p.m. of the day following the test results. In addition, the security measures were stepped up as well. Many graduates will have to pass metal detectors upon entering classrooms. Metal detectors will be used in the most ethical and sensitive manner, similar to inspections at the airport. In addition, cell phone jammers will be installed in the buildings. Four types of them were purchased, including the Chinese model, with all devices operating at the same frequencies as mobile phones. Thus, numerous complaints of parents and criticism of independent experts with respect to hazardous radiation are not justified, assures the ministry representative. Speculations on the cell phone jammers are like a storm in a teacup. The experiment proved once again that these devices are absolutely safe at a distance of two to six meters. The police will not be present during the testing, yet classrooms will be under surveillance cameras. If necessary, recorded videos will be used as evidence of cheating, fraud or other offenses, and the cameras will be installed in 1,281 classrooms. The Ministry of Education also promised to equip each room with air conditioning and to provide free food for students who will be traveling to other towns to take the UNT. In total, more than 120,000 high school graduates will be tested this year. 5,000 of them could claim the prestigious special mark of distinction, the Altin Belgi. Rumors about gold medals in exchange for bribes were dismissed by the Ministry of Education. The Deputy Minister, Mahmet Agali Sarbekov, made it clear that education in Kazakhstan is not for sale. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching and goodbye.